Greetings, and welcome to this brief introduction to Plato's dialogue, The Hipparchus. Plato's Hipparchus is a short dialogue, but it's strange in several ways. First, in this dialogue, Socrates appears to defend lovers of profit against the angry denunciations of an unnamed comrade. Now, this is strange because Socrates is famous for being very poor. So why would this shoeless philosopher with his threadbare cloak appear to defend profiteers? Second, although Socrates is also famous for being able to do whatever he likes with his interlocutors and arguments, in this dialogue he clearly fails. He fails to persuade the comrade of the stated conclusion, namely that all human beings love profit. At the very end, the comrade says that Socrates has forced him to agree, not persuaded him. Third, and connected to that second point, in the middle of the dialogue, Socrates goes on a very odd monologue in which he praises the Athenian tyrant Hipparchus, who lived almost a hundred years before and who gives the dialogue his name. Hipparchus was Athens' last tyrant, and his assassination ushered in the democracy, the regime in Socrates' own time, a regime that ended up executing Socrates himself. Now, why would Socrates praise a tyrant? and behave in a rough, quasi-tyrannical fashion to his interlocutor. To begin to deal with these puzzles, let's first consider the outline of the Hipparchus. It falls into three main parts. In the first part, Socrates asks the comrade, who are the lovers of profit? The comrade gives three responses, each of which Socrates shows tangle the comrade in self-contradictions. So first, the comrade calls the lovers of profit those who would seek to profit from worthless things. But Socrates shows if that's the case, then either they are fools or they're non-existent. Second, the comrade says that the lovers of profit seek to profit from everything out of greed. But Socrates gets him to agree that all people seek to avoid loss and get the opposite, namely profit. So all people would be lovers of profit. Third, the comrade says that lovers of profit seek to profit from things decent people would not. Again, Socrates shows that the comrade believes that loss is bad and profit is good, and that all people, decent and worthless, seek profit. The comrade now is angry, not only at lovers of profit, but also at Socrates. He feels that Socrates is tricking him. So, in response, in the middle part of the dialogue, Socrates tells the story of Hipparchus. Now, Socrates seems to want to bridge his divide from the comrade, but what he says about Hipparchus is shocking. Far from being a tyrant, Socrates says, Hipparchus was a wise man who tried to educate the Athenians through poetry and through his own sayings, including, deceive not a friend. Hipparchus was so successful, Socrates claims, that his would-be rival teachers assassinated him. Now, Socrates clearly sets up Hipparchus as a parallel to himself a philanthropic, public-spirited teacher who is killed due to envy. Unsurprisingly, however, Socrates' praise of a tyrant doesn't win over the comrade. So in the third and last part of the dialogue, Socrates returns to the question of who are the lovers of profit. He lets the comrade revise his argument, and the comrade removes the premise that all profit is good. It's just the acquisition of something more by spending less, he says but an acquisition of what? Something good. So the comrades back to the position that since all people, he says, want what's good, all are lovers of profit. In one last attempt, the comrade says that profit is money. It's getting more silver or gold while spending less. But money is desirable for its worth, namely its worth in exchange for good things. Again then, profit looks good, all people want what's good, and so all people are lovers of profit. The comrade is exhausted. He agrees with this conclusion only verbally, but clearly his heart rebels at what he considers a vulgar outcome. So then, what is Socrates up to in this dialogue? Why does he bring about a result that just gets the comrade angry at him? If Socrates himself is a lover of profit, which is a big if, how does this seemingly failed dialogue profit him? Perhaps it does so in part by allowing Socrates to see what his comrade will and will not accept. The comrade holds fast to the belief that all people seek their own good, 
but he just as resolutely refuses to believe that people should seek only their own profit. In his view, decent people should accept profit from decent sources, but they should spurn bad profits, so to speak. Still, he thinks that even bad profits are profit, that is, good. So in his view, decent people should sometimes refuse their own good. Now, why would they do that? The answer may be bound up in a word that the comrade uses frequently, worth. In his view, profit has worth as measured by money. But some profits come from, quote, worthless sources. How could that be? It must mean that the comrade believes that activities have a moral worth separate from their economic value. So to take an, a contemporary example, for instance, you can profit economically from buying stocks and oil companies, but many people say that you should not do so, believing that their activities are immoral. In short, the comrade wants not only to acquire profit, that is, to acquire good things for himself, but also to be worthy of that good. The comrade never articulates his belief so clearly. Indeed, he's a rather limited interlocutor. He defines profit only in terms of money, for instance. And he never raises the obvious objection that most people do not seek their own good above all, that they pursue things like justice or friendship that demand sacrifices. But maybe by his very limitations, he instructs Socrates. By his very pedestrian quality, by his failure to soar and to talk about nobility of self-sacrifice, the comrade reveals how strongly even the decent person desires his own good. In so doing, he may have provided Socrates with further confirmation of the soundness of Socrates' own life, which, as Socrates says in the Apology, he spends pursuing not money, but the greatest good for a human being, conversations about virtue and related matters. And that is no small profit. Thank you for joining this brief introduction to Plato's dialogue, The Hipparchus.